So I'm Doug B. Secker. Um, this is actually the second time I've presented at the summer school, but the last time I, pres I was here I talked about the solar cycle and forecasting that. And so the very last thing I think it is in this afternoon's talk is I'll reprise part of that. So I have been at the Space Weather Prediction Center, which was not called that when I joined. It was named this, it was known as the Space Environment Center in October of 2002. Uh, it was my first job as a civil servant. Prior to that, I was a contractor at NASA Goddard uh, working in the Solar Data Analysis Center with Joe German. Prior to that, I was doing a uh, postdoc at the University of Birmingham in the Birmingham, England. The group I worked with uh, no longer exists, unfortunately, so um, you know, just due to the way things, dynamic things happen in, in this field. And then um, I did my degree at my PhD at the University of New Hampshire under Jim Ryan, where I studied mostly solar flares. And uh, my undergraduate started at Carnegie Mellon with a bachelor's degree in physics. So there you kind of know my whole professional career, and I know nothing about you guys. But. Uh, so March of 1989 was probably the event that changed my life. So. I had already been working in solar physics. I'd worked on the Solar Maximum mission as a student, um, summer student even. Um, after my junior year in college, I worked at Goddard. Uh, I was actually working on a mission, Solar Maximum mission, but studying cosmic gamma ray bursts. So I kind of did the opposite of what everybody else was doing. And yet working around all these solar physicists, I realized, hey, wait, that's what I want to do. I want to go on. And get my PhD and, and, and work with people like this. So I went off to grad school to study the sun. And it was still March of 89, so it was still my first year of grad school. And I assume you all know what happened in March of 1989. But it was a blackout in Quebec. And it made the cover of Time Magazine. Now, Time Magazine, I don't even know if it's still around. I framed that cover, and, and it's in my office. But to me, that was, hey, this thing, we're studying the sun to understand it as a star. And now it has relevance, of course, it always had relevance, to that day-to-day -day life on Earth. And that kind of became the thing that made me really, really, really passionate about the sun and studying it and trying to understand that. So. Uh, ending up at the Space Weather Prediction Center was almost like the, the, the place where I needed to be. So my expertise is definitely on the sun, solar flares, coronal mass ejections. I'm more of a scientist, and I dabble in the impacts. We have a separate forecast office that is responsible for the forecasting. So I'm going to do the best I can here when we do our deep dive. Um, there, I chose areas that I think are probably ones that weren't covered as well, maybe earlier in the week. And, uh, and we'll see how this goes. So to me, space weather affects nothing, because how many of you have ever felt the effects of space weather, right? So this makes it really, really difficult to talk to anybody about space weather, you know, your neighbors or your family. And you know, the way I look at it is we work directly with industry, the industries that are impacted by space weather. And if we are doing our job, you will never be impacted by space weather. That's, that's the real goal, is total prevention. If something bad happens, that's probably, I can't say it's because nobody was doing their job, but it's maybe because we didn't do as good as, as we need to. So I was, I was going to start with a broad overview, kind of give a general overview of uh, space weather impacts from all types of phenomena, CMEs, flares, energetic particles. And then, as time allows, we'll do a deeper dive into some impacts. And the power grid I put first, because I definitely want to cover it, because that's where really the focus is 
And when I say the focus, the focus in the United States, the focus in England, the focus in all of Europe, the focus in Asia, everybody's now focusing on provision of electric power, whereas what I would argue 15 years ago when I showed up here at the Space Weather Prediction Center, it seemed like the ionosphere and communications was what most of the other places in the world were concerned about. And so, um, and then satellites and humans we'll get to again as time allows, and those are the more traditional impacts that people think of. So the first and most important thing is space weather impacts are global. Even though we have the one space weather forecast office for civilians in the U.S., we also have a, a, um, an Air Force counterpart that handles the DOD side. Um, we don't really discriminate, right? Space weather doesn't stop at our borders. And so when we're doing a forecast, we ex of course expect it to be relevant for the whole world. And impacts are not, not limited, right? So everywhere from, uh, you know, all countries from Australia to Japan, you know, in the Asian sector to, um, you know, high frequency outages over, over Africa, ocean drilling in the, in the Pacific and the Atlantic, uh, polar routes that fly not only from North America to Asia, but from Europe to Asia. So it's, it's a global concern and there's more and more countries definitely beefing up their space weather expertise, establishing space weather forecasting offices. The thing that's becoming, that's making space weather more and more relevant is the, I mean, you might say, well, we've always, you know, modern history, we've always been industrialized. Certainly that's true in our lifetimes, but, you know, the interconnectedness the efficiencies that corporations are trying to build into the economy are ultimately making them more susceptible to space weather. So it really comes down to, and this is why we, we worry about electric power, and I, I believe this is a, a slide that Dan Baker put together a few years ago showing how, you know, of course, to pump water you need electric power to you know, do banking and finance, you need electric power. For government services, you need, you know, you need electric power for, for all of these things, for our, our fuel supply. And if you're missing one thing, it, it impacts another and another and another. And, and you know, all of society, you, you could almost put onto this little chart and you see how interconnected we are. So you lose one element of that chain and, you know, there's a significant impact on society. So keeping the lights on is really probably these days the most important thing we think about when we think about space weather. GPS gets used in ways that, you know, may surprise a lot of people. GPS is used to support banks through timing, so time, the GPS, Global Positioning System, is time and position. And timing is used for, um, for banking transactions. When I transfer money from the US to the UK and it gets lost, which happens, believe it or not, using Zoom, Swift tracks that down to a very small fraction of a second. And then you can see exactly where the money went and, and how it got there. Um, but the one that would surprise most people is timing on the grid. And they have to balance the power almost instantaneously. And so they have to know. And so GPS timing is important to running the grid these days. And then, of course, there's the stuff we expect for transportation, knowing where uh, a train is or airplanes are or ships or what will be coming, you know, even uh, tractor trailers on the highways. And of course, communications networks 
uh, and, and knowing where you are, wireless internet, uh, GIS. The GPS has become this completely interconnected thing as well. And as I'm sure you guys know, space weather impacts the power grid, space weather impacts GPS, which I'm sure Tim Fullerell covered in great detail yesterday. So, and then, you know, the one thing I would say is when space weather happens, we all know about it because, you know, the media will pick up, pick up on it. Um, and, you know, so, you know, and this is indicative of the fact that space weather is a global phenomenon from the U.S. to Europe to, you know, it's not just, you know, even Fox News will cover, cover it even if uh, they use some sensational language. But, um, so let's deal first with geomagnetic storms. Why those first? Because I'm biased and that's where I do all my work, so. But what I like to say when, with, about geomagnetic storms is they're kind of like the hurricane equivalent for space weather. You know, most people can understand tornadoes and hurricanes. Tornadoes are destructive, but over only a very limited area and for a short time, usually. Um, you, know, you could have a tornado a few miles from where, you, where we are and we would never know it. So to me, the solar flare is like the tornado. The geomagnetic storm is like a hurricane. You, you have to be more than a few miles from the eye of the hurricane to not feel the effects. You're going to feel the effects over hundreds of miles, over a very large area, and the effects are diverse because it might be the high winds, it might be the heavy rains, it might be the storm surge. There are a lot of different ways a hurricane can impact you. And in that same way, a geomagnetic storm can have a wide variety of impacts. And so the basics, you guys already know all this stuff, right? Uh, fastest CMEs probably get here in about 17 hours. Uh, is that, you know, could they get here faster? That's actually a really good question. The science of extreme events is an area that we definitely need more work in. Um, you know, theoretically, what's, what's the fastest event that could get here? What's the most damaging storm? What's the maximum magnetic field? Of course, it disturbs the magnetic field for a duration of hours to a day or, or, or longer. Uh, I like to say up to about 36 to 48 hours, you know, coming from the CME. And, and of course, our only visible manifestation of space weather is the aurora. And so I, I will tell the average person that if you look up and see the aurora overhead, you better believe there's a problem with the power grid because, you know, it's not very rare. It's very rare that, you know, here in Colorado we can look up and, and see the aurora. So it's going to take a pretty, pretty intense storm to do that. So we, nah, it doesn't come out very good, does it? So we measure space weather on um, standard scales, and this is where the analogy to tornadoes and hurricanes follows through. Uh, it's about 20 years ago, the Space Weather Prediction Center came up with this scale system as a way to communicate space weather to the public. And now it turns out it's also a very convenient way to communicate it up through the, the levels of government. And we measure it on a scale from one to five. Um, in, in our case, a G1 is the lowest level of the G scale. We consider that minor, that's a K, KP of five. Um, our lowest alert level is actually a KP of four, so it's even below that. So it gets a little difficult to communicate with the public when you're actually using two different scales. <laughs> but. Um, and a G5, an extreme event, are rare, but they happen a couple of times a solar cycle, although we're still waiting for this solar cycle to give us one. And of course, that's measured by the deviation in the background magnetic field as measured by magnetometer stations 
Um, and so this is just the, the Boulder Station on a not too disturbed day, although not quiet day, back in 2011. And here is the 1859 magnetic storm as measured with a magnetometer in India. And of course, 1859 is the famous Carrington event I'm going to assume people have heard about. I think I, I might address that later uh, in the afternoon. So, like I said, geomagnetic storm impacts are wide ranging. This does not cover all the impacts, but this covers what we consider to be the, the main, the major impacts, the main areas of industries impacted. So, GPS, I always say if you're driving in your car and you need to turn, you know, 30 feet ahead, you're not worried about space weather. You don't need centimeter accuracy to know where to turn your car. But precision agriculture, where farmers are not even driving their tractors, right? They're remotely controlled, and they're, they're planting a seed. And then on the next pass they're coming through, they want to put the fertilizer in the exact same place they put the seed. They're not spreading fertilizer over the whole field just to fertilize the seeds that are spaced, you know, every 12 inches apart. They're, they're spacing the fertilizer. Well, of course, if you come along and you put the seeds somewhere and then GPS is off and you're now putting your fertilizer two inches to the right, you're not getting efficient use of that fertilizer and you're wasting money. So farmers need to worry about GPS now. Surveying for roads. Um, there, there have been instances where surveyors using GPS have laid out a road, they've paved it, and then they've had to come back and rip it up because the surveying was that wrong because of space weather. Drilling. The floor of the Gulf of Mexico is so crowded, they have to know with great accuracy where that drill bit is going, where those anchors are going, so they don't actually accidentally drill or cut through somebody else's equipment. So um, another one is, I don't think I cover this, um, well maybe I do, is drilling ships that use GPS and thrusters to keep them stationary on the surface while they've got the drill bit in the ground. And of course, the military using GPS for all sorts of things that thankfully we don't, we don't have anything to do, do with. Uh, power grid we'll cover in more detail. Aircraft we'll cover in more detail. Um, yeah, one of the things I won't, don't have any slides on, is next gen. Who knows if next gen stands for next generation air traffic control. It's supposed to be GPS based. Uh, I think when I first heard about it, we were supposed to have had next gen about two years ago based on the original schedule. I have no idea when it will happen, but you know, it, it scares me a little that they're going to use GPS to place airplanes closer together in the airspace. So what happens then when you have a loss of GPS? Do you just instantaneously space all the airplanes further apart? Well, no, that's, that's going to be, to me, an issue. Um, and then, of course, space flight, both people and satellites. Those are the things people might typically think are impacted by space weather. See, this doesn't even cover things like um, drones and pigeon racers. Or, Whole, whole variety of things that are impacted by space weather. And of course, Aurora. So tourism around the Aurora, I don't know that it's a big business, but it's a business. I know people who are not scientists, they're not people I know because of what I do, who have gone to Alaska with tour companies to see the Aurora. And so having good forecasts definitely important, although the most important thing is, is knowing, you know, what are the best seasons and times of year and phase of the solar cycle. 
travel. So the power grid. Um, what we're really worried about with the power grid is not the fluctuations in the Earth's field, but as we all learned in Physics 101, you, you vary a magnetic field, and in any conductor, you're going to endure, and, sorry, induce an electric field. And that induced electric field is what is a concern for the power grid, and we'll get into that in, in much more detail. The, um, the big problem is not the current flowing on the, 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 the grid itself, it's what happens when it gets to the substations where the transformers are. And it's the impact on the transformers that we're con concerned about. So have problems occurred with the power grid? Of course they have. In fact, I'm not sure anymore. Um, the, the, these pictures, no, these are not the March of 80. This picture might be March of 1989 transformer. Certainly, here's the Hydro-Quebec release about their outage that happened within about 90 seconds of storm onset. September 19th of 1990, uh, generator step-up transformer. Homeland Security report from 2003, of course, talking about this, the Swedish power system blackout. So it's not like we worry about this stuff happening every day, but it's also not a small problem. When it happens, it can affect a lot of people. And you know, here's where the numbers are debatable. Um, so here is a report that was put out by the National Academy based on the the 1921 geomagnetic storm. I guess as you've all seen this, the, it's a plot done by John Kappenman showing the, the nodes of the high voltage power system, so the very high frequency, or very high voltage, excuse me, power grid, and showing the areas that would be most likely impacted uh, the size of the circles reflects the risk of failure uh, in a storm, which is in, in, in a scenario where essentially no protections are taken by the grid. So it, it really is a worst case scenario and probably not. Um, that said, that sort of assumption still gets made. The UK just released a report in July studying the US power grid. <laughs> for a worst case storm. And it actually frustrates me when they say, well, the assumption is that we provided no, you know, the scenario is we provided no warning of the impact. Yet, you know, there are offices around the globe whose job is to do exactly that. And so that tends to inflate numbers. Uh, that's what we believe, that's what the power grid operators believe. Uh, in this initial study, it was estimated that in the U.S. alone, it would, it, would cause, it would damage so many transformers that it would take up to 10 years to replace them. Steps have been taken since then to, uh, at that time, transformers were not even produced in the U.S. So they brought production back to the U.S. There's another issue with transformers, and that is they're usually built to spec. You know exactly where you're going to put it. You know what that node needs to look like and what it's going to connect to. They're going to design the transformer for that site. So now they're designing um, what I would call Swiss Army knife transformers that kind of have all the types of connections you might need. And you'll just ship it and plug it in and connect it where you need to. Doesn't mean that there wouldn't be any issues, but you would be able to recover much more quickly. So this study, it's a Cambridge University uh, report. Um, I read the executive summary late last week, and I've already forgotten the name of it. They instead uh, put the recovery much quicker, and 
say, well, in the U.S., the most extreme costs they can come up with are about half a trillion or $500 billion, but point out that economically, any loss of productivity in the U.S. is going to ripple across the country or across the world. And so they did estimate about a $2.7 trillion global impact. So these are huge numbers for the most extreme events. And there's a lot of people looking at these kinds of things. And I would argue we still don't even know what the most extreme event really is. So what happens? Well, reissue, we see a CME erupt on the sun. We say there's going to be a G3, G4, G5 level storm. What does the power grid do? Well, they have procedures for taking action. So that's how we, we mitigate it. Um, the most common thing is they will ensure they have excess capacity in the system to deal, to deal with added voltages. And they do that by making sure they're not operating at full capacity. So that could mean bringing equipment that's offline online. Um, they're certainly going to cancel you know, vacation for people they need to have positioned and, and you know, even though the Quebec situation happened in about 90 seconds, uh, they can monitor the temperatures of these transformers and literally position people in the most sensitive places of these systems to turn them off and mo you know, monitor their temperatures and shut them down as needed. So they, they don't have to do that very often. So, there are standard procedures, right, when, when our alert gets to the power grid operators, they automatically bring up, in this case, solar magnetic disturbance and what their actions that they are expected to take during, during such a, a storm. Um, the power grid operators will say they need five minutes warning. So, when we see the CME hit that L1 satellite, which is now Discover. Uh, even in a, a worst case event, we're talking 12 to 15 minutes. So that is enough time to protect the power grid. So the wide area augmentation system. Uh, most GPS systems have that as an option. Most these days, I think, automatically enable it. The WAS is a system, by the way, when it's all red, that's bad. WAS is a system that uses base stations near major airports. And it's used to give airplanes on approach the correction they need to know about local disturbances in the ionosphere so they can get the accuracy of GPS they need to land. Because when you're coming down to land, you don't want to have well, of course, a 10-meter error is actually OK. right? So, so the vertical error limit that the FAA has, actually, I'm going to get this wrong. It's either 50 or 70. I can't remember. But it's, it's somewhere here in the yellows and up into the red. When, when you're in the reds, your GPS is off by at least 70 meters and you're going to come in at the wrong angle and the wrong speed when you try to land. You can imagine bad things will happen. So they're not allowed to use those procedures to land during storms like this. Uh, it's not that they can't land, right? Maybe they have to use visual flight rules instead of, you know, but um, the pilots need to know that. So you need to be communicating it to the pilots and have the right rules in place. So this happened to be two periods during the Halloween, the, so October 2003 Halloween storms, where, uh, yeah, so it is 50 meter limit for the FAA. So, you know, it, again, if you had an entirely GPS controlled system, you really wouldn't want to be flying at this time. I don't think we'll ever go to a fully GPS controlled system. This is just a, a brief 
chance to talk about satellites. So geosynchronous satellites are the ones that we rely on every day that we kind of forget that they're there and they're doing their job. So every time we use an ATM or go to our bank or buy something in a store with our at the at the you know with a credit card, we're probably using a communication satellite to move that transaction around. And this solar cycle, we had two interesting satellite failures that I think are worth talking about, Sky Terra 1 and Galaxy 15. Galaxy 15 made it in the news because the satellite got damaged enough they could no longer uh, control the thrusters and it started to drift in orbit. And the problem was it, it, it was left in an on position, meaning the transmitters were still transmitting which you might think is good, it turns out it's bad because if you've got a drifting satellite, it's drifting past other satellites and, and its beam is getting in, its you know, transmitter is interfering with those other satellites. So this became known as the zombie sat. They were eventually, I think it took about six months to regain control of that, uh, but by then they'd already replaced it. Um, bigger companies keep spare satellites in orbit just for such reasons. Sky Terra 1 is an interesting story because FEMA, and I'll talk about that, um, was becoming the Federal Emergency Management Administration for the US, FEMA, was looking at space weather and, and why did they need to be concerned about it. And we pointed out there's two things. One is the electric power and two is communication. They said, well, we looked at the communication thing. We're not worried. We've got backups. You know, good. And focused on the power grid. And, and I swear it was like six months later. And we get a call from an emergency manager, I want to say in Florida, might have been Georgia, somewhere in the southeast, saying, hey, my comm system is down. I, you know, my, my backup system isn't working. You know what's going on. So, you know, it's not like they tell us, a satellite operator tells us, you know, oh, our satellite's not working. So we tend to find out other ways. And it turns out Sky Terra 1 was a satellite used by emergency managers around the country, by law enforcement around the country for their satellite communications. Now, in this case, it wasn't that big a deal because their standard way of communicating is HF radio. But I'm sure you guys all know HF radio is what you definitely lose during uh, solar flare or you know certain large storms. And so if you lose your HF radio and you lose your backup satellite, uh, you can be you know in big trouble when you're trying to, to work in an emergency. So um, this slide from the White House to Whitehall, um, I left in just because even, the, even the, the heads of governments are aware of space weather these days. President of the United States has something called the PDB, President's Daily Brief. So when significant space weather has happened, Space weather has appeared in the President's Daily Brief. Most of the President's Daily Brief is classified, so I've only seen a tiny snippet of pieces of it. But um, this was a few years ago where we established this, the new space weather capability in, in the UK, leading up to the, the Olympics in London and standing up the, the Space Weather Center in, at the UK Met Office and establishing you know, formal relationships between the two countries. It's not unique that we, only, you know, we don't only work with the UK, of course. We work with many, many countries. Um, the most recent um, forecast office to be established, actually, is in Mexico. And you know, we're working closely with them. Oh, so FEMA. So we're worried about 
all sorts of things. So space weather can be the cause of a problem, or it can interfere with or degrade the ability to respond to a disaster. So FEMA has visited the Space Weather Prediction Center. We've held workshops to do you know, tabletop exercises uh, and, and you know, game scenarios to see how to respond to space weather events. The US, you know, every agency that you could possibly think of, Homeland Security, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, Federal Electric Regulatory Commission, NASA, NOAA, Federal Emergency Management Association, and the White House, you know, everybody that you know you could think of is involved. So here's what FEMA has set as their levels for being notified of and taking and making responses uh, to space weather. So here's our space weather scales, G1 through G5. S1 is uh, what we call the solar radiation scale, or solar energetic particles. And then solar flares are the R scale, and I'll cover that in a second. Again, it goes from 1 to 5. Um, not all of that is shown, because we don't alert at all levels of flares. But FEMA basically says, well, at the G3 and S3 level, it's OK to send us an email. And you know that's just situational awareness. But when we get up to the G4 or G5 alert levels, then it's a phone call to the FEMA operations center that automatically dials in all the relevant parties so that everybody in the government gets the same message about what we're expecting in terms of space weather. So. At the G4, G5, S4, you know, there's never been an S5 event, solar radiation storm. So one might question whether we got that scale right when it was invented. But um, so at these low levels, we're not worried about things at, on, on that, that national scale, typically. Now, radio blackouts, of course, you guys know all this. Solar flare erupts um, causing ionization in the atmosphere affecting HF propagation, duration, you know, minutes to hours. And the impact is only going to be on the, you know, the day side of the Earth. Impacts on GPS, which are, um, well, communications and radar. Uh, in this particular case, you know, this was an, an, an X2 flare. Get alert that went out, and I'm wondering what's happening to my computer. OK. All right, so the way we measure solar flares, again, scale of 1 to 5. R1 is uh, an M1 level flare on the GO scale. M is the soft x-rays, so 1 to 8 angstrom, band pass, the GOES x-ray sensor. Um, and here you want to scale A, B, C, M, and X. And exactly what those stand for is not entirely clear. You'll hear people refer to that as maybe medium and extreme. but that's not really clear. Um, but R4 is an X10, and R5 is an X20. You can imagine impacts increase as we go up the scale. But the, the, the place probably where flares have the most impact, so this is the air traffic control room. I'm actually not sure if this is New York or Oakland. Um, so the, the main U.S. air traffic control centers that cover uh, the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans are New York City and one in Oakland. And so you can't, hard to see, but that 
this, this map of the globe showing HF absorption, which tells you which areas of the globe are being impacted for HF radio, is permanently displayed in the air traffic control centers. Because when they're communicating with an airplane and they lose contact, the first thing they want to know is, is it because there's a problem with the airplane or is it just because I can't talk because of a solar flare? So they need to know why they can't talk with the airplane. In fact, this actually will tell them that maybe they can try different frequencies. Going up to higher frequencies will often work, especially for smaller events. In fact, they're one of the few, also one of the few operators that I'm aware of that understands flare probabilities enough so that the, the uh, person running the floor will brief the air traffic controllers when they see the, that we've issued flare probabilities that reach certain thresholds. So um, the um, impacts happen on, on airlines all the time. It doesn't mean there's a problem. It's really just a, a change in the way they operate. So again, here's another example from 2012 where the San Francisco, I believe the station is actually in Oakland, um, reported the East and West Pacific regions were severely impacted by the, by the R3 uh, solar flare. GPS, this is rare, but GPS can be impacted by solar flares. Mainly, it's, you're going to see increased ionization that's going to change the signal propagation length and give you errors. But ever so rarely, a storm just causes direct radio frequency interference. And this was the case for a whole bunch of GPS receivers in North and South, or, yeah, North and Central and South America in December of 2006, where this particular solar radio burst, which is about the largest one on record and what we think is very close, it's certainly close to the one in 100 year max, um, caused each of these GPS receivers in red to fail to be able to pick up the GPS signal. So if you were trying to use GPS on the West Coast, you know, at that time, you would not have been able to get a position from your GPS receiver. The advantage of a flare is they, they only last a few minutes, so the outage for GPS was very short. Of course, if you were trying to do a critical operation, exactly that time, you could have seen a major impact in your GPS. The solar radiation scale, the S scale, because uh, of course we all know flares aren't radiation, right? Uh, so it's always a struggle to, to talk about this one, but, but radiation is a scary word when you talk about it with the general public because they all think instantaneously like atomic bombs and you know, everybody's going to die. And so this is, this is probably the most difficult one to communicate to the public. An S1 through S5, like I said, we've never seen an S5. But we measure the, the proton, the greater than 10 MeV proton flux, which is actually the green line, or no, sorry, the red line. Um, with the GOES satellites, the green line is the greater than 100, 100 MeV flux. And so um, that's, again, one of the things from a customer impact. Some people may be more sensitive or care about the low energy stuff, but it's the higher energy stuff that's, that's more of a concern. Of course, we know there are particles coming from flares or CMEs, but the ones we're mostly concerned about are the CMEs. And where's the access? Well, the geomagnetic cutoff and rigidities allow the, the protons into the polar regions, 
where they hit the atmosphere. And um, we worry about, well, we worry about satellites, we worry about people in space, launch vehicles. Um, it was interesting about two years ago, SpaceX called and like, hey, we're about to launch and we just heard that, you know, we have to be worried about these proton things. Can you fill us in? Uh, aviation, from a communications and a health perspective, and of course, HF radio, which is related to the air aviation communications. So you might say, well, who flies over the North Pole? Well, it turns out a lot of people do these days. I've never done it. But uh, in 2011, there were like 11,000 flights that went over the pole. So that's a, that's a lot. And the numbers have gone up. A few years later, it was up to about 13,000 flights a year. And the number one concern, once you get above the Arctic Circle, is space weather, because everything else is pretty constant. The only var real variable is space weather. And of course, you worry that during a proton storm, you're going to disrupt the ionosphere, and you're going to screw up high frequency radio. And so when you're, when you're up here, you can't see the communication satellites that are over the equator. So the only thing the airlines have for communication is HF radio. If they lose HF radio, they can't talk to anybody. They have a problem, and they can't talk to anybody. Well, bad things will happen. So they're not allowed to enter the polar region if it's known that HF is a problem. So just based on those proton data, airlines will make decisions to reroute airlines. And, and as you guys know, proton events last for days. And so that'll affect many, many flights. So this is the one, this is another one that's tough. Do we have to worry about the radiation from proton events? I'm not an expert on that. Um, we as a center are not an expert on that. But to me, all the evidence shows that the average person, uh, the only one that might be concerned would be a pregnant woman flying over the pole during a radiation storm because the lowest uh, limits for health reasons happen to be uh, for fetuses. So there's, that's, that's probably the only real risk today. But then you know, the Richard Bransons of the world want to put us in space, and then we all do have to worry about the health impacts of space. So there's only been one instance where the FAA has issued an alert telling pilots that there's a radiation risk. It happened in 2003. Uh, so this is an alert that comes out from the FAA based on our data, that um, they don't actually tell the pilots what to do, but they, this alert says, you know, satellite measurements indicate unusually high levels of ionizing, ionizing radiation coming from the sun. This may lead to excessive radiation doses to air travelers at geomagnetic latitudes above 35 degrees north or south. That's all, that, that's all the FAA will say. They don't tell the pilots or the airlines what to do to that. But I can tell you what happened in October of 2003. Virtually every pilot descended to lower altitudes. Of course, that's good, right? More atmosphere between them and the incoming radiation reduces exposure. It's bad, too, because it takes longer to get where you're going, and you've got to burn more fuel, and it costs money. And the airlines don't like it when they do that. Also, of course, not everybody can crowd into the same airspace. So it becomes a, a management issue with all the planes when such a thing happens. So satellite impacts, um, pretty rare, but satellites have been rendered completely useless. Um, loss of control, I mentioned 
Galaxy 15. Serious noise and image data. If you're using image, image errors like star trackers to tell you where you are, you can get confused. Um, damage to solar panels. Um, we're probably going to lose the SOHO mission due to damage to solar panels rather than anything else. Uh, we figure there's probably four to six more years worth of life in the solar panels as they degrade due to ionizing radiation. Um, what can a satellite operator do? Well, most commercial satellite operators won't do anything. They'll just take the risk. They'll assume they designed their satellite to survive. Um, but during the October 2003 events, the uh, folks that would talk about it, which were mainly NASA and NOAA, will tell you what they did. And that was, you know, they turned off sensitive instruments or safe spacecraft. Uh, most people, even commercial people, will avoid doing maneuvers or doing any critical activities during a space weather storm. Uh, they're more concerned about assessing things after the effect. Uh, and uh, they'll, of course, increase the amount of monitoring they do to make sure that things are continue to work during a storm. So space weather is, this is actually, um, it's one of those things, it's hard to get too excited. Back in 2011, there was a lot of stuff happening at the government levels about, uh, you know, this electric infrastructure security summit in the Capitol building, about people are going to do something about, you know, protecting the, the grid and, and our country from, from space weather. Oops. Um, there's now, actually, there's now also a companion house bill to this, the Space Weather Research and Forecasting Act. Um, it's the latest in what I would say is a, not a long series, but a recent series of attempts to um, you know, put a bigger focus on space weather. Um, will it come to pass? I don't know. Um, Congress isn't very good about passing anything these days. But uh, this one is kind of is good because it's not just about forecasting, but it's about uh, you know doing more research for space weather as well. All right, so half an hour. Let's see how much of a deeper dive we can do. So that was kind of my broad overview of you know, a variety of impacts. It certainly wasn't all the types of impacts. Um, probably take a full eight hours to, to cover everything. And you know, what, what I just showed was kind of like the, the easily digested version that you can communicate uh, with anybody about. So um, the power grid, like I mentioned, this is where all the focus seems to be. Um, it worries me that we focus on extreme activity. What if we go 20, 30, 40 years without an extreme event causing a blackout? Are people going to lose interest? So to me, it's going to be important to understand the day-to-day -day impacts of space weather. And so this is work done. Kevin Forbes is an economist who teamed up with Chris St. Cyr, a solar physicist, and has done a series of papers now on the economic impacts of space weather on the power grid. And he is not talking about an extreme event. He is talking about the day-to-day -day impacts on the price of power for the grid. Um, Part of the issue, it's almost like anything in science, right? If you're the only one publishing on something, of course, if you've done it, it's absolutely right, and you got everything right the first time. I don't know where. But, but ideally, you get a lot of people working on a topic and finding you know, the flaws and the assumptions, or you know, we, we, we all make mistakes, or 
Maybe we had a data set that was limited and we didn't even realize it at the time. You know, all sorts of reasons why you know, you can't be 100% sure of an answer. And so you know, to date, you know, Kevin is the only one doing this type of work for the power grid. Really good to get, to get more people involved. So space weather does affect, according to Kevin, price repay for electricity because it affects the availability of power. So the outline here, and this was presented at the summer school of 2012. Not his whole presentation, I, I picked pieces of it. So a bit of background on the, on the electric power grid, um, GICs and prices in one particular part of the grid, PJM, and a, an explanation of why prices are affected. So electricity generation isn't just, you know, uh, I'm going to pick the local company, Xcel Energy. It's not like they have you know, power, the power generating stations and they only provide that power to their customers. It's not done that way anymore. Certainly there's an element of that, but people will make power where it's cheap and move it to where the people are. And that's really why we have the problems with the grid we have today. So the, the power company itself is not responsible for moving that power. In fact, they're essentially a customer. They're saying, do I need power? or do I have power I can give to others? All of that is brokered by these groups known as Regional Transmission Organizations, RTOs, or ISOs, Independent System Operators. So uh, the key to this economic argument is these guys operate by basically selling electricity that you need tomorrow. They'll give you a price today for what you think you need tomorrow. And then when tomorrow happens and you realize you didn't buy enough, you've got to buy some more instantaneously. That's called the spot market price or the real time price. Um, if you've guessed wrong, you may pay a lot more for your electricity tomorrow. Of course, you don't see that. You pay the same bill every month, right? But the next time they have to increase your rates, that might be why. So the country is broken up into a whole bunch of these different transmission or system operators. The one I'm going to focus on is PJM here, which covers a substantial portion of the northeast U.S. and, and, and um, mid-Atlantic region of the U.S. Sorry, that's New England is covered by ISO New England. There's New York, but Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ohio, West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, all, all covered by PJM. So these guys are trying to control everybody within their region, and then they're also moving electricity across uh, to, their, to their neighbor regions. So this is, this is, I don't even know economics, so I don't know why I left this in here. Uh, Information efficiency is a concept of the most accurate price of the electricity of, of any product will come when everybody knows everything the, about the availability and demand for that product. So the electric power grid is essentially open an open auction um, to you know, say, well, here's how much power I can generate, here's how much electricity I'm going to need, and you literally have an auction for how much you're going to pay for that electricity. And so that's believed to be the most efficient way of pricing electricity. So, um, so like I said, we have 
Scheduled dispatch in the day ahead market is based on offers to provide generation, which in turn are based on marginal costs, right? So obviously if, if you're trying to buy something and oh, I'm trying to think, there's some auction sites on the web that do this sort of thing, but offers generally accepted begin with the lowest price, person that's willing to pay you, you know, charge you the least. And then of course, you, if you still need more, you, keep, you go up to higher and higher prices until you get enough so you've bought enough electricity to equal your anticipated demand. So, and then um, the, the, the price is determined by the characteristics of the, the units that are going to give you that energy. And the day ahead price is going to be reflective of, of the cost of the fuel that's needed. You know, is it going to be coal? Is it going to be solar? Is it going to be gas? Oh, uh, I meant to take this one out. I'm going to skip that one. So one of the things, and actually this is probably the most important takeaway, I think, about the power grid. When you're explaining to people that you're worried about surges and you know, geomatically induced currents on the power grid, we are not talking about part of the power grid that comes into people's homes. Okay. So power is generated at a generating station. You step it up to higher voltages because, as we know, it's more efficient to transmit power at high voltages on what's known as the transmission grid. So we have generation, we have transmission, and then when it gets to local areas, you, you step down to lower voltages where you then send it out to customers through the distribution network. So the distribution network is not where the currents are getting induced. Currents are getting induced on these high voltage 100 kilovolt to 765 kilovolt lines. And the higher the voltage, the easier it is to induce a geomagnetic current. So, um, so that's the part of the grid. But of course, this part of the grid doesn't work unless you can move the power from here where you generated it to there where you need it. So the transmission grid is, is a key factor in all of this. The economic value of electricity in 2010 was $370 billion. And the real cost, I mean, that's just what people paid for electricity. Everything we do with the electricity is obviously much higher than that. Um, so this is just an example of day ahead and real time prices for January 2005 in the New York power system. And you can see the most dramatic example, actually, they, the day ahead price is the blue. And you can see some variation. It's US dollars per megawatt hour. Um, a, a bit of change here. I couldn't tell you specifically why any day was more expensive than any other. Um, but then, obviously, something happened in January of 2005 that caused the, the real-time price to, to increase by a factor of eight. And clearly, nobody had planned for that. So there was a real increase in the cost, completely unplanned for. So here are the issues. Electricity cannot be stored in large volumes. The power grid is not a battery, although um, Tesla is talking about you know, home-sized, home storage batteries that you might be able to use to, to isolate yourself from the grid. Uh, System operators manage the variability in demand through forecasting. And average errors tend to be modest, but basically you get these large outliers or fat tails. And you have to worry about occasional outages from, from your generation capability. So it's, a, it's an AC system, alternating current. 
that introduces its own level of concerns. There are people talking about a DC grid as an alternative. The, um, in the US, we operate at 60 hertz. Most of the rest of the world operates at 50. Uh, and to maintain that frequency means you actually have to balance the grid so that supply equals demand instantaneously, not just on average. And so the frequency actually falls when demand exceeds supply and road goes the other way in the opposite case. Reliability goes down. So they will send power that they don't need just to balance the system. So this is the first inefficiency in the system. So if they are not forecasting the correct amount of power they're going to need, they're going to have to end up sending power that they're basically throwing away just to balance it to keep the frequency correct. So um, here's an example from, I think, yeah, it's the England and Wales power grid over a two-month period showing the, oh, I thought this was a frequency plot. Maybe I put the wrong one in. Um, showing the uh, amount of balancing power they had to put in uh, at different times. And then this is showing one particular day how the frequency on the grid varies as the load and demand change. And so they're trying to avoid large excursions by putting in this balancing power, which is based on forecasting. So, so there's more to the stability, though, than, than keeping the frequency within the stability limits. There's also real power. That's the stuff. Yep. That's time. It's two months. Sorry. it's. I got this figure from, what's that? Well, I think that's a case of, it's really just the direction you're putting the power. Are you, are you a, a, a giver or a receiver of power? So. Um, so real power is the thing that we put our cord in the, socket and, you know, we can use to do things with. Reactive power is what's needed for stability, so I believe it includes that balancing power. But, you know, reactive power is also, it's, it's being used by its losses in the transmission lines, it's in the transformers, it's in the motors. And it's that reactive power that really is the big problem when it comes to space weather. Because Excess reactive power can lead to the voltage collapses and the system instabilities. So, um, and this inadequate reactive power can also be a contributing factor to number of blackouts. Um, and so this just details a bunch of blackouts around the world, uh, including Hydro-Quebec, which was a voltage collapse due to inadequate reactive power and an August 2003 blackout in the Northeast. Uh, adequate management of reactive power was a contributing factor. So, I think we're good. As of, this is an example. PJM provides power for a substantial part of the Mid-Atlantic. There's a lot of people that live these areas. And this particular analysis covers a two-year period in the early 2000s. Here's the region that they cover. PJM operates with this both real-time and day-ahead markets, and prices are done hourly. And ideally, their prices will be equal across locations, but that's only when the system isn't stressed, when there's no congestion on it. 
But when there are constraints, prices will vary significantly from location to location. So this is PJM's hourly real-time price minus its hourly day-ahead price for the, the entire year of 2003. And you can see how the price of electricity, if they'd forecast it perfectly, the difference would be zero. Um, there was one period here in the middle of the year where maybe they, they had a good stretch. Um, or maybe that, or maybe there was no data. But you can see that generally the number of US dollars per, per in this case, kilowatt hour, I believe, might be megawatt hour, um, you know, varies by as much as 50 to, to $70. The PJM works with trading hubs, and their two big hubs are on the eastern part. I don't know exactly where it is. One might guess, you know, Delaware or, or, or Maryland, eastern Maryland, and a western hub, probably western Pennsylvania or Ohio. Oh, actually, sorry. I forgot. They're both given here. They're actually both in Pennsylvania in this case, and you expect equal prices in, in these in two hubs. So in a, by examining the difference in prices of the two hubs, you can see if there are constraints on, on your system. So, and the important thing is, as we mentioned, Generating plants are mainly in the western portion, and the demand is mainly in the east. And so over the sample period, the average transfers from west to east were about 5,000 megawatts, megawatt hours per hour. And they use a 500 kilovolt transmission system. And so how do they impact the system? They impair the performance of the transformers and space weather, GICs, lead to adverse reactive power. I didn't remove the wrong slide here. Um, this particular paper, Forbes and St. Cyr found that in the PJM system and then extrapolating that they estimated that a um, change in price due to space weather events caused the wholesale price of electricity to increase by 3.7%. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's $500 million over 19 months. So, real dollars. Let's do satellites quickly. This is one you guys you hear about, and it's, it's the kind of thing people expect. Well, of course, satellites are impacted. They're out in space. Um, satellites don't really fail very often. In fact, um, satellite failures occur about two to three times a year, but most of those are not due to space weather. In fact, that's kind of the hard thing. You've got a satellite up in space. It's acting funny. And can you tell me why it's acting funny? Um, but in 2003, 46 of the 70 failures that occurred, occurred during the Halloween storm. So we know just from statistics and the correlation, clearly space weather had that impact. Now for any one failure, can we pinpoint space weather as the cause? That's always the issue. So in the uh, last solar cycle, these were the sort of the five, sorry, not five, the seven major satellites that failed for various reasons due to space weather, we believe, uh, adding up to about two to three billion dollars. So these are the satellites out of all that failed that we believe were due to space weather. And certain ones, like Adios and Midori too, I think generally it's widely accepted that space weather caused the impacts. 
L star 401 is still controversial um, all these years later. There are papers saying absolutely it was space weather, and there are papers saying absolutely it was not space weather. So whether you include that on the list is you know, a question. So what's impacting the satellite? Well, we worry about low energy electrons giving us surface charging. It's not the charging that's the problem, it's the electrostatic discharge. High energy electrons, or what we call deep dielectric charging, causing charging internally. And again, we worry about the discharge. Solar flares, impacts on the, the solar panels, we discussed briefly. Um, cosmic rays, and even the protons will cause single event effects, and now we worry about uh, damage that, that can be catastrophic. UV, which has more modest impacts, but uh, degrades surfaces, and if you have uh, optical surfaces, you know, degrades those. So this is just an example of Cosmic ray hits on sensors. It's great to put a CCD up in space because you, know, you can see these things. And so this just shows a SOHO image. Um, everybody, I'm sure, has seen these movies of the Halloween storms where you, know, you see the CME and then boom, your detector's covered with these protons and you can't see the CMEs anymore. So that's a concern just for providing warnings. The, um, the effects, of course, are on the electronics in the, in the spacecraft. So whether it's penetrating radiation, single event upset on a track through a sensitive part, deep dielectric charging that goes through a sensitive component. You know, all you have to do is damage one transistor and maybe that's the end of your satellite. So we're not talking about, you know, satellites don't catch on fire. There's no visible damage. You're just basically breaking an electrical circuit in some way. Um, deep dielectric or yeah, deep dielectric char charging, of course, is electrons bury themselves in in an insulator. They slowly leak out. Of course. That's under normal conditions. Things are, are you know, behaving nicely. But if the electrons are coming in faster than electrons can leak out, you build up an excess charge, which eventually has to discharge. And you know, it's very likely that most of the time those discharges cause no impact at all. But again, a discharge in the wrong place or at the wrong time can make all the difference. Um, so we worry about single event upset, single event effects, like single event upsets, where a state change from just a zero to a one, from a energetic ionizing radiation going through, could you know could send the wrong command. It could cause a reboot. It, it could cause all sorts of effects. You worry about a single event latch up that is a permanent state change and may not be resettable. And single event transient um, that literally is something that may have a temporary effect. You don't even have to do anything to, to repair it. So um, particle fluxes are large, but anomalies are rare. Um, cosmic ray fluence through a satellite, 10 to the 12 particles per year. Single event upsets, you know, six orders of magnitude lower, but that's still a lot. You know, about a million events per year. Now you come down another factor of 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6, and you get, in terms of anomalies, 1 to 10 a year. I mean, real anomalies, not single event upsets. Um, so really, across all satellites, the mean time for a failure is about 250 years. 
So this is probably reason number one why commercial satellite operators don't care about space weather because for them commercially it just doesn't make that much of a difference. So could they go do even better? Yes, but it then becomes very, very expensive. And this all comes into design and the build of the satellite because once it's in space, they're not going to touch it. So I like this phrasing. Satellites are reliable 364 days of the year, but that last day of the year, you know, being reliable is going to be the most expensive one to do. So I am going to skip. I, I never actually expected to get to the human spaceflight impacts anyway. Um, what we worry about is ionizing radiation. I think I'm going to come. This is, this is probably the one area where forecasting is the worst. The science is the least mature. It's an area I think that's ripe for students. But this particular event is near solar minimum. And people are like, well, we don't care about space weather at solar minimum. We always have to remind people space weather can happen at any time, not just at solar max. Um, so a time of few sunspots, very few flares, then boom, sudden appearance of a large sunspot. Um, and you know, five days later, it's at the west limb. What happened? Well, this is what happened. Here's your boom, there's your solar energetic particle event, your 100 MeV protons, up to fluxes of a, a few hundred per cubic per centimeter square per second per steradian. And even your heavier elements like oxygen greatly enhanced. And so uh, an event like that, so for the astronauts, on the space station, the impacts were mainly scintillations, like you can literally maybe see it in your eyes. Um, and you know you would move to the most hardened part of the space station, which just protects you by a factor of two relative to the least hardened part of the space station. But like anything, that's all you're trying to do is reduce exposure. However, had you been an astronaut on the surface of the moon in your spacesuit, then you'd have worried about radiation sickness, vomiting, fatigue. You don't really want to get sick in a spacesuit, so hopefully you were somewhere where you could get inside and take off that spacesuit. Um, Yeah, I know. Yep. Um, and then uh, that particular event, we lost two satellites. Airplanes had to divert from polar regions, and all sorts of, of tracking problems. So, um, the last point I want to make, this one is still highly controversial. Um, Apollo 16 flew in April of 1972. Apollo 17 flew in December. So eight months later. And in between that, we had the flare of August 7th, 1972. Ben estimated the dosage was about 400 rem. If I go back to this slide, it's believed that that sort of exposure may be fatal for about 50% of people within you know, a, a two-month period. So there's, there's uh, again, like anything, this is one that's highly controversial. There are people that would say astronauts would have died had the Apollo mission flown at that time. Um, there are others that say, well, yeah, they would have gotten sick, but they wouldn't have died. So. Um, 
I'm going to skip all the radiation stuff and basically remind you we're, we're mainly interested in geomag storms and the diverse impacts. Um, radio blackouts causing the communications problems. Radiation storms mainly impacting communications and satellites, but as we expand our presence in space, the health impacts of, of that are going to become more and more important. I think that's our time. I hope I found a few things that you guys found interesting in all of that. I'm not sure quite how we all this. I will be talking about forecasting this afternoon, and I promise you it'll be a little more entertaining. Order. Let's start right here. So the que yeah, so the question was, have we noticed any impacts from the National Space Weather Plan? And the space weather, well, the National Space Weather Strategy and the Space Weather Action Plan? And the short answer is absolutely yes, um, although maybe not in ways. Let's talk politics here. So um, there are definitely activities happening as a result of that. Um, they're not public yet, but I led one of the teams that established benchmarks for solar radio bursts for one in 100 year storms and theoretical maximums. Similar benchmarks have been established for geomagnetic storms and radiation storms and solar flares. And, and those now are going to be used by a group that's now been funded. Yeah, I think it's OK to say it, too. Kevin Forbes is involved with a larger group of economists that are now going to use those numbers to estimate the economic impact of space weather. So that's just one example. Um, another example, I'll use again one I'm involved in. Neutron monitors are used for a variety of things, but for space weather, one of them is our ground level events. So if you are measuring the neutrons on the ground, you better believe people in space are, are feeling the effects. And the neutron monitors, in the US at least, have not been well funded for a few decades now. And there's a renewed effort to not only find the funding for the existing stations, to, but to expand the neutron monitor network to ensure that it's covering the right parts of the globe to accurately monitor the amount of radiation. And the main focus is on, much to my chagrin, is on aviation radiation safety, even though I might argue I'm not really that concerned about it. There are enough people concerned about it that we want to make sure we have the neutron monitors to feed the radiation models to accurately estimate how much radiation people are getting. Those are, that's just two small pieces. There's, there's lots and lots of effort going in. But what I would say about the Space Weather Action Plan is most of it's planning. So with the neutron monitors, we will specify where geographically we think the neutron monitors need to be and what type of monitors and how much it will cost then it's up to the government to decide whether to spend the money to make it happen. And it's the spending the money part that mostly you know, hasn't really happened yet. And it's not clear if it will happen. And I know many of the agencies are worried about unfunded mandates. Is it something they will be forced to do, but to do it by taking money from other areas? Question here? Yep. Yes, 
Yeah, so the, um, the uh, physics of the ionosphere, is my, my knowledge of that is pretty limited, so I will admit that. But, but when, when the high frequency radio is not really even bouncing off the ionosphere, it's actually getting absorbed and re-emitted, the frequencies that get absorbed during a flare as you increase the density of the ionosphere actually, um, oh, what's the terminology? Um, I want to say cutoff frequency, but that's not right. But maybe it is. Um, gets higher and higher as you increase the density until ultimately it doesn't matter what frequency you're, you're trying to bounce off the ionosphere, it'll pass all the way through. So it's an absorption uh, issue of the, of the radiation. Anything else? All right. You have an announcement or something? Yep. Yeah. 